to see association in Europe. Many of them are on this teleconference due to the magic of Zoom. So you're truly uh, international today. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, well, first, thanks for having me back. It's always nice to be invited back. Maybe that means that you did something good the first time. So I will catch you up on what I said uh, last year and then really spend most of the time on this uh, MEF2 transcriptional activator. And I just wanna give a shout out to Matt because I was able to remove half my slides uh, because he gave a lot of the IPS and CRISPR-Cas9 that I was gonna talk about. So that's fantastic. I can just show you the results without uh, having to worry about that. Um, so uh, Matt actually mentioned this, that excitatory inhibitory imbalance is uh, thought to underlie many of the abnormal phenotypes in, uh, in ASD. I'm having an issue with my screen here, but I think I fixed it. Uh, the transcription factor MEF2C is involved in multiple forms of autism and intellectual disability. And so we hypothesized that boosting its activity might normalize EI imbalance and neural behavioral abnormalities. And we screened what's called the Scripps Reframe Library. The Scripps Reframe Library is uh, a, a unique library that Scripps chemists, you know, Scripps, I am so honored. Scripps has uh, it's been ranked one or two in the world in chemistry. The chemists think I know some chemistry, so we're all going to be quiet about that. And um, they put together a library of not only all the FDA approved drugs, as Matt had mentioned, but all the EMA approved drugs in Europe and other compounds all over the world that have made it through phase one safety trials, even if they're not yet on the market. So the beauty of that approach is that we have all the drugs basically that have been ever tested in human uh, that are safe and we, we are able to test those. And now the lead candidate I'll show you today has extensive experience in humans for another indication and shows excellent NF2 activation and corrects EI imbalance. And I'll show you some of that data. Okay, so this is bringing Coles to Newcastle. You've heard this in multiple other talks. The latest CDC statistics are now one in 44 children. Um, you've also heard Dan Geshwin's name in both Sarkis's talk and, jo and Joe's talk. There are multiple slides. Um, Dan is also my colleague. And uh, he looked at, uh, I'll show you the data in a moment, a series of ASD um, genes and was able to parse those genes in the families. And interestingly, the transcription factor, MEF2C uh, and MEF2A, a related transcription factor, control many of those genes. Uh, Dan then contacted me. I was the discoverer of MEF2C. And uh, with Dan, we've been uh, looking at MEF2C in various neurologic diseases, uh, including um, uh, autism spectrum disorder with intellectual disability. So our reasoning is that therapies aimed at improving MEF2C associated ASD phenotypes might potentially affect many other forms of ASD because we know not from IPSC data, although we do know it, from real human data that MEF2 controls many of the genes involved in ASD and intellectual disability. So here's some of Dan's data uh, from a paper in Cell and you can see these five hubs of genes that are many of the genes that um, uh, jo Joseph uh, showed you in the prior talk. And MEF2C and MEF2A are two of a few transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins that go in and turn on genes. So they control many of the other known autism genes. Now, interestingly, MEF2C itself can be mutated and form a very severe form of autism and uh, intellectual disability. We first discovered this actually in a mouse and then um, colleagues subsequently discovered it in humans. And so this is a gene that uh, encompasses the MEF2C region. And now we know specifically of many mutations in MEF2C that cause this. Uh, if you look at the UK database and some other databases, it, it has the uh, possibility of being extremely frequent. Um, in that, uh, you know, more frequent than say Rett syndrome. Oops. And uh, these children generally have severe autistic behavior. Only a few of them talk, accompanied by epilepsy, periodic tremor, and abnormal EEG. We'll get back to the electrical activity in a minute, and often severe intellectual disability. Although there are a few um, that are less severely affected that I've seen. I'm also a physician and have seen. Um, Gee, it must be nearly a hundred of these cases now and I'm in contact with many of the families. 
So we have two disease models, one you just heard about. We also use human patient skin biopsies, both from uh, patients that we then use CRISPR-Cas9. We take tractable mutations. These are mutations that are not too large that we then can correct. We've also introduced mutations uh, into the normal genome to mimic MEF2C. So we have a whole family of these uh, MEF2C uh, mutants. Importantly, we've used multiple genetic backgrounds. You must do this to ensure that it's not something in the background that's causing your phenotype. So we have them from multiple families that we've corrected. We also have a MEF2C mouse that we published shown here, and we use that, that to test our drugs. Although like Matt Lally, we feel really, it's really important to do this in a human context in iPS cells. Okay, so let me show you our disease in a dish model of the human MEF2C haploinsufficiency syndrome. And so as Matt just eloquently explained, so I was able to take out many of my slides. Uh, we take patients, make uh, human iPSCs, then we can differentiate them into neuroprogenitor cells, into neurons and multiple other cell types. Uh, we've done that not only in two dimensional cultures, but in these 3D mini brains called cerebral organoids, I'll show you some pictures in a moment. And this just takes you through the stages. These show that we've made NPS, NPCs, that is uh, uh, pluripotent cells. We then uh, can take them through the various stages to make neurons. They start to look like neurons, but importantly, they stain um, uh, to show their neurons. They have the electrophysiological characteristics of neurons. We also have done single cell RNA-seq, and I'll uh, tell you about that in a minute. So I think the most important finding uh, from this, which should be appearing shortly in science, it's translational medicine, is that the MEF2C ASDs uh, make a lot more astrocytic cells and fewer neurons. So here MAP2 is a marker for neurons, and you can see there's not a lot of green here in the MEF2C child's MEF, uh, uh, neurons. In uh, wild type, estrogenic wild type, a lot of neurons. And the opposite is true if you look here, um, GFAP and S100 uh, beta in this context are um, astrocytes, and you can see more in the MEF2C neurons. Um, after six or 10 or weeks in culture and uh, fewer in the wild type. So you're not making neurons properly, also not making synapses properly. Um, yeah, so I mentioned we can make these 3D uh, cerebral organoids in a dish. We've actually brought some of these kids in, told them we've made, we created a little piece of their brain or part of their brain in a dish. They look like this. Uh, many of them actually have little ventricles, what you have in your brain, as you can see here. Uh, they have layering. I won't go through all the different uh, layering we have, but we get them pretty mature. Uh, we've kept them for six or nine months. Uh, we do this in multiple diseases, uh, Alzheimer's disease, which I'll come back to at the end, actually. Uh, but I'll show you the autism studies today. And then single cell RNA-seq shows multiple cell types. Interesting deficits in both excitatory and inhibitory neurons in the MEF2C ASD patient samples versus wild type. And others have shown that MEF2C is very important in both excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. Interesting also in human microglia, although I won't talk about that today, uh, but we think that underlies some of the infections these kids get. Okay, so let's cut to the quick. What do these cerebral organoids do? Well, they manifest EI imbalance, excitatory inhibitory imbalance. Uh, they actually have too much excitation. And this is one indication we have patch clamp recordings, this is calcium imaging, we have multi-electrode arrays where we can record the whole brain like an EEG. I just wanna show you calcium imaging. I showed some of this last year, but we have a lot more to show you now. And so you can see this is the normal wild type and the neurons are signaling to one another. And uh, we can quantify this. I'll show you the quantification in a minute. If you look at a kid, um, a child, iPS cells, now this child happens to have seizures and whoops, we've actually, recreated the seizure in a dish. You can see it pulsating like that. We can quantify that. Not all of them have seizures. Sometimes they just have too much electrical activity. So the EI is balanced in this case toward E, too much excitation. You can see it here. Last year, I talked about a drug that we're developing called nitrosynapsin. And you can see when we put it on, it calmed things down dramatically. Here it is again, we calm it down, see everything that's much more toward normal. So as I mentioned last year, this is a uh, an interesting type of glutamate receptor antagonist called the NMDA receptor. Um, it's based on a drug that I patented actually for Alzheimer's disease, it's now one of the FDA approved drugs for Alzheimer's disease called memantine. We modified the structure of memantine and it has a second site of action at a 
site we call the S nitrosylation site, the more chemistry that had been discovered in my lab um, some years ago. So this is a dual acting, um, very, very potent uh, drug, but very, very safe little company in Boston is uh, developing it. Um, here's an update on that, and then I'll get to the MEF2 activators. Uh, so I won't show you again, but I showed you last year and we published it, that this drug nitrosynapsin, the damps down the only the excessive excitation, doesn't affect normal excitation in the brain. It also corrects multiple neurobehavior abnormalities in our MEF2C mice. We've now nearly completed pre-IND studies in preparation for a human clinical trial. We're actively seeking financial support. Uh, there's a major philanthropist uh, who's involved in, uh, in autism who's considering funding the trial, but we'd love to include any of you if you're interested. We are actively raising funds for the trial. Uh, we're going to do a phase one, two trial at the same time. And we've identified the first site, which will be uh, at Mass General. They've developed a clinical biomarker um, that reflects this excessive NMDA receptor activity so we can get an early readout with our biomarker in addition to doing our neural behavior tests. So that's the plan for nitrosynapsin. Let me now turn to this uh, MEF2C approach, which we're very excited about, and which the Brain Foundation and the MEF2C Association have been funding recently in the lab. And so I mentioned that obviously MEF2C haploinsufficiency, where one copy of the gene is missing or is, has, has a deletion or is somehow um, not working, uh, there's one allele, that the other copy of MEF2C that's still there. Perhaps we could overstimulate that and compensate. And then most importantly, because Dan Geshman had shown that MEF2A and C are very important in controlling those hubs of many, many other genes involved in ASD, we reasoned if we could increase MEF2 activity in general, uh, we might be able to turn on those genes and offer some benefit. And so we carried out high throughput screening of the chemical libraries I mentioned at Scripps, not only that reframe library, but multiple other libraries. We have about a million and a half uh, compounds. I haven't screened all of them. I don't believe in that mindless screening. We screen for drugs we think are in categories um, that can work. So we have about a hundred uh, case screen that we've done. And uh, we've identified five drugs that are existing drugs already been in humans. And we have one candidate, I'm um, gonna call it compound Y today. And I'll show you some data with, with that compound. So how do we do this? Well, as I mentioned, MEF2, MEF2C and A, um, and there's other forms of MEF2, but those are the two that we know are involved here. Um, they bind to a piece of DNA and turn on various target genes. What we've done is replace one of those target genes with luciferase reporter, something that bioluminescently for, uh, has bioluminescence so we can see it in the screening method. And then we add multiple drugs uh, um, and we see if it activates MEF2. And here it's shown in a 384 well plate we have a luminometer to read that bioluminescence. We can put one drug in each and we get um, uh, basically certain drugs turn on MEF2 activity shown here on the y-axis. We have what's called a very good z-score. We have a good anything over 0.5 means you can go and screen your libraries, which we've done. So here's one typical screen of many that we've performed. And this is MEF2 activity. Remember turning on that luciferase. So we're gonna turn on all those genes that are turned off, not only in MEF2C haploinsufficiency, but in many other forms of autism. And you can see the top hit here is this compound Y. We do have other hits, but we're particularly interested in this one because it has very extensive use in people for other, another indication. Um, and so now we, um, more precisely look at MEF2C activity for the aficionados out there. We do a, uh, we compare it to Ranilla. So we just wanna make sure it's not turning all transcription on, but just MEF2C, Ranilla is to monitor background activity, if you will. And we have very good activity at MEF2 sites. So we would turn on MEF2A and C in point of fact. Um, now we wanted an indication. Remember I said the neurons weren't growing properly and they weren't growing out their neurites and their synapses. So we have multiple ways. I'm just gonna show you one of them. We can actually look at that neuronal marker map two, which is all over the neurites. And we can quantify that as shown on this plot here. And what you see is there's more uh, map two when we treat uh, the haploinsufficient uh, um, neuroprogenitor cells that have less MEF2C. And um, you can see much more map two protein. I, I won't show you pictures, but also we get many more neurites and synapses 
um, when we put the MEF2 activator back in the, into the dish or into the cerebral organoid. Okay, so remember I showed you this picture of a child with seizures, boom, boom, boom. We can actually quantify that aberrant electrical activity, giving you EI imbalance. And such a, a, a that's kind of shown here. So wild type, you do have normal electrical activity. Here we're just looking at those calcium bursts. And you can see in the MEF2 patients, this is patient one, but we, as I said, we have a half a dozen patients. You get these bursts of calcium activity, whoops. And um, when we put on compound Y, we still get the normal activity, no more bursts, and it's quantified here. So we are able to rectify EI imbalance. We're now testing this compound to look at various behavioral um, phenotypes. So, so we're really excited about it because it's been in patients. Um, it's interesting, it's not FDA approved. So that also gives us an intellectual property approach to it so we can get some company interested in bringing it forward. So in summary, what I told you about today, and I was able to go quickly because Matt, um, fantastic job, Matt, in, in kind of uh, giving a lot of the background, I could skip those slides. So we were looking at MEF2 haploinsufficiency syndrome, and uh, particularly we're interested in this excitatory and inhibitory imbalance as a biomarker, if you will, um, of drugs that might improve not only MEF2C haploinsufficiency syndrome, but other forms of autism that have EI imbalance. Now, just amazingly, my close colleague at MIT, Li Wei Sai, published in Science Translational Medicine last month that MEF2C is also important in various forms of dementia. We had been worried if we played with MEF2C later on after initial development, we actually might do damage rather than help. And I think that's a real worry about genetically interacting uh, with any of these genes that, that Joe or Matt or, or I have been talking about. Um, but here we have Li Wei who's vetted this for us and she's actually found in the oldest old people who have a resilient Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, they have more MEF2 activity. And in a mouse model, if you decrease MEF2 activity, you get a form of dementia. Multiple mouse models of dementia have left MEF2C activity. And if you genetically increase MEF2C activity, you can abate the dementia phenotypes, memory, uh, cognition, uh, and multiple neurobehavior tests that Li Wei and her group did. So we're now testing our drug in Li Wei's dementia models as well. And so what does this mean? Well, we think this EI imbalance, and we recently published a review on this in um, Annals of uh, Annual Review of Pharmacology, is that at the extremes of life, life is a bell curve. We're all somewhere on that bell curve. At the extremes of life, um, your nervous system is very, very susceptible to EI imbalance. And it's not just the neurons. As other speakers have mentioned, um, other cell types, uh, both the myelin-forming cells, the astrocytes, microglia, they're all involved in this EI imbalance uh, in an intricate network. We know that, and so is the extracellular matrix. And we think you're vulnerable and you paradoxically at the extremes of life can develop this EI imbalance. And some of the drugs we use in one disease, say in Alzheimer's, might be amenable to being used uh, in autism to correct the biological pathway that's being disrupted. Uh, and I showed you that the MEF2 activator compound Y increases not only MEF2C transcriptional activity, but this biomarker phenotype of EI imbalance. Uh, this is a drug that's been in people, has no significant toxicity, and so we're really excited about bringing it forward. So I've had tremendous help here, the people that have um, help me, other labs as well. Here's Dan Geshwin, Jeff Rosenfeld here at UCSD, Nick Short, my bioinformaticist. Um, I particularly want to acknowledge and thank Pramila at the Brain Foundation, who had the faith in us doing this at a very early stage of the work. Thank you. And Sarkis and Joe, whoever votes for this, thank you all very, very much. And also, I want to acknowledge the MEF2C Association in Europe that I mentioned, which is a fantastic group of families with uh, with a tough disease, with MEF2C haploinsufficiency, who have banded together really all over the world um, to try to help with this kind of work. Uh, so this is where the work is done. It's a beautiful building right opposite the ocean. I better not talk about this. I know the weather back east doesn't get right now. Um, and you're all welcome to visit after COVID, please. And I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, that was really enlightening. And I would encourage people to, to um, ask their questions in the Q&A. Uh, there's one question, maybe I'll start, and, and Matt, feel free to, to jump in as well, but it's, it's more of a general question on the iPSCs and how well they can model the diversity of neurons found in the brain, human, animal, what have you. Um, I guess that's the first part of it. And secondly, to what degree does 
um, this correlation or lack of correlation with the diverse neurons, uh, whether it's at the expression level, the activity level, the neurotransmitter level, to what degree does a, an intervention like a, a drug or a CRISPR uh, intervention inform us about what neuronal subpopulations may be relevant in, in the human brain? Yeah, so that, uh, let me start with that and then we can get Matt to chime in too, if you don't mind, that'd be really good. Um, yeah, you're right. Look, we have a developmental model in addition. Luckily, this is a developmental disease. So it's not that we're trying to model a very old disease. Now, um, my colleague, um, Arnie Krigstein, who has worked on uh, development in iPS cells for a number of years, has wrote a series of uh, papers and also uh, editorials, if you will, about this question. Can you model in a dish uh, a human disease? I mean, you're in a dish. Um, so there's several issues here. One is, um, the cells don't develop totally normally, uh, even in the uh, brain organoid model. Uh, they develop more slowly. And, you know, uh, I think particularly this is important for neurodegenerative diseases. You're 65 or 70 years old, not like autism when you get a disease. But interestingly, in the dish, they're under a certain amount of stress. And that seems to speed up the development. So even Arnold has agreed with us that we can mimic many of the features of the disease. But this is why having a biomarker of the disease that mimics the phenotype like EI imbalance is so critical here. What I'm telling you is I can in a dish mimic a finding that I found in mice and others have found in EEG in patients. And I can use that biomarker to use my drug discovery. So like Matt, we're also doing something called CMAPS Link 1000 where we have thousands of drugs that fix transcriptional activities and we can screen drugs um, that way. Um, you know, I think, I think that's fine. Matt, I actually didn't know that it had also been done in uh, human neural uh, progenitor cells. I may write to you to get some more data on that because um, the database I have is not just for human neural progenitor cells. Now, let me address the single cell RNA-seq data. We do see a diverse number of different cells in our cerebral organoids, okay? Now, I can't tell you we have every type of neuron, um, but we have looked against adult databases and we have, and that's how, actually how we classify the cells. We look at a transcriptome um, signature, if you will, of say an excitatory neuron in the striatum. And we can match those. And we do see a vast repertoire of cells, but I know we don't see all the cells in the cerebral organoid, but we do see many of them. And so we're encouraged that because we have that phenotype, that electrical phenotype that we're very good at, at monitoring, we think we have some um, concordance, if you will, on the disease. Sure, thanks, sir. Uh, a couple more uh, quick questions, I think. Um, is a planned trial for compound Y in patients with MEF2C mutations or in a different subset of AST? Yeah, so that's great. There is no, um, although we're working with colleagues to get this, we, we really don't have uh, what they have for Rett syndrome, which is a natural history study of MEF2C, which would really facilitate our doing a clinical trial. While we'd like to do that, I think all of these drugs, and we've met with the FDA and discussed this uh, ad nauseum, um, we're probably going to be doing it in another subset of, of ASD patients that are a little more tractable. Um, yeah, so both for nitrosynapsin and the, uh, MEF, and the, the MEF2 activator drugs. That's the plan right now, simply because the FDA is driving us that way, but we hope in the future, we absolutely want to treat those children. Uh, look, all of our children need help with this and we're working hard on that as we all are at the symposium. Yeah, I, I could imagine having um, a pre-screen based on a narrow, subpop a narrow genetic subpopulation, which is, you know, make re recruitment so challenging that it would be, you know, very difficult, difficult to even run the trial, right? Um, I'm just wondering, maybe just, just dovetailing off that question, because MEF2C controls so many other genes, are there other, you know, either genetic or maybe physiological parameters one can use to enrich for a population that may respond to the drug? There is, as I mentioned, the Mass General uh, Group has developed a biomarker hmm. that, um, that, uh, that, you know, they'll be publishing and talking about soon, and it actually reflects the phenotype I showed you. And so we're very, very excited about that biomarker because, you know, when you have a little company taking a drug forward, and I've done this several times now with memantine and other drugs, you have to kill a drug. You have to, this, this is the, the trick of a little company. You don't make a drug, you kill a drug. So you get to the right drug eventually. Mm -hmm. So having a biomarker for an early readout in a study is absolutely critical. 
if it's a reliable biomarker. And we think we have one. Joseph, you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering about, you know, some of the, at least the nitrosynapsin and, and even this new compound Y, they seem to be working on, as you said, excess electrical activity. What about trying it in just epilepsies? On, you know, intractable epilepsies, for example. Yeah, well, that, that will be one of the readouts. You know, many of these kids have epilepsy. So that is one of the endpoints we've discussed with the FDA. Thank you. Stuart, thank Great you. Talk. One more question in, in the Q&A. Uh, does nitrosynapsin activate mTOR? Well, you know, downstream it may. What it does is, I haven't looked at that specifically, but we know that it, um, well, we partly have looked at that. So it, we've tested it in a tuberous sclerosis model mm -hmm. and um, it's published. And I'm not gonna be able to conjure up that immunoblot in my head right now. We've looked at the pathway and it corrects the pathway. It, it does interact with the mTOR pathway. So the answer is yes. And we think that's because it's in part, these are many of these genes are neuronal activated genes. And we know that MEF2 damps down this excessive electrical activity. Interestingly, it spares normal synaptic activity. That's why it and memantine that I developed previously are, are so well tolerated as opposed to many other drugs that have tried to interact with the NMDA receptor. Sure. And Joseph, uh, is that a, a legacy hand that's raised or do you have another question? <laughs> Uh, that was I, great, sorry, I'll, I'll just remember that one. We'll, we'll move on. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, so Thank we'll you all. On. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolutely. To, to the next talk by Kazu Takahashi. Uh, Takahashi.